Hello and welcome to this edition of Global Visitor. I'm Liana in Beijing. The University of Copenhagen is among the oldest universities in Europe. From the second half of the 15th century until today, it has developed from being a place of learning for the social elite to one where learning is accessible to all. That change of role, with a focus on academic excellence, has helped the University of Copenhagen to become a global hub for research and science. Copenhagen University has five campuses spread across the Danish capital, but originally it was placed just inside the walls of this ancient city, and housed in buildings that still stand today. For over 500 years, the university has been a center of learning, culture, and groundbreaking discoveries, and today it still attracts great minds and talent from all over the world. Even if Copenhagen University is rather small compared to many others, it has taken a leading position among the front runners on the global science and research scene. Well, I think it's a combination of being, a, you know, quite old university, even by European standards. We are more than 500 years old. Have uh, eight or nine Nobel Prize winners behind us, uh, and uh, we have an extremely strong tradition for science and uh, letters. Uh, and we have also managed to become a modern university which, uh, which uh, builds on this tradition but uh, applies it uh, towards the future and we are playing a significant role in also facing, uh, trying to help solve some of the challenges that uh, we are facing today. Copenhagen University was founded by the Danish King Christian I in 1479 following approval from the then Pope Sixtus IV. Like all European universities of the time, it was a part of the Universal Roman Catholic Church. Students here could study law, theology, philosophy and medicine, and they led a completely unique life. And that's because the university was a state unto itself, with its own laws, courts, and even its own prison system. Only in the late 1700s was it brought under jurisdiction of the Danish state. The most radical shake-up since the late 15th century took place when the university formally appointed a board of governors, alongside the rector, as late as 2004. At the same time, the university's character began to change. While it was previously mostly concerned with teaching, research began to play an increasingly important role. Copenhagen University being the oldest university is a flagship uh, of course in the, the Danish educational system and uh, what we hope is that they, they will develop even more collaboration with institutions uh, around Denmark to make sure that uh, some of the quality that's inherent in this uh, old institution is also uh, distributed out into other educational uh, institutions and we see already that uh, because we've set this agenda a new collaboration uh, is developing within the institutions in Greater Copenhagen with our Universities of Applied Science and the old academic university, uh, Copenhagen University and this I hope will also spur uh, new innovation and perhaps new education and uh, therefore we think that uh, Copenhagen University as a flagship has a responsibility not only for its own students, but also to lead the pack in the rest of the education system. Denmark is a small country of just five and a half million people, and it only had one university, Copenhagen University, until the early 20th century. Now, there are five universities with campuses spread all over the country. Still, Copenhagen University is the biggest, with some 37,000 students, 7,000 staff, and five campuses set in the relaxed, culturally vibrant heart of Copenhagen. Uh, we are building a strong tradition for going across disciplines also, so we are uh, moving towards a matrix structure where we can both be very classical in our approach and have the classical disciplines, but we can also uh, have a lot of traffic going across the disciplines and, uh, and uh, working in teams uh, facing, for example, some of the grand challenges that we, uh, we have in energy or aging population. Most students take a three-year bachelor's degree, followed by two years of master's study. Many go on to extend their postgraduate work to obtain a PhD degree. 
While fundamental research and the opening up of minds are the main aims of the university, it is grounded in the reality that students also need jobs. That is why the education offered is a blend of theoretical and practical skills, while teaching and research are closely integrated. If you go back 50 or 40 years, I mean, uh, university education was an elite education in Denmark. Now it has become more, say, a mass education, going from, say, a few percent of, of uh, every year's um, harvest of, of students until now, uh, I mean, we aim at uh, some 20 percent going for higher education. That is a major, that's a great difference. What I think we have succeeded in Denmark, uh, to do in Denmark, is to... Um, actually emphasize the need for people to be independent, the need for them to think themselves. I mean, the Danish education system so far uh, does not aim at people being able to reproduce what they have been taught, but to think of what they have been taught and then use that. I think that that actually is, is, is quite interesting and hopefully we can maintain this tradition. From stargazers to deep sea explorers, from those who read the human anatomy like a book to those who sought the innermost workings of the atom, Denmark has produced an astonishing amount of talent in the natural sciences. Perhaps best known among them is the Nobel Prize winning physicist Niels Bohr, who spent much of his working life in the buildings behind me, which are today known as the Niels Bohr Institute. Well, in, in 1913, uh, Niels Bohr published three papers and they were actually the start of what we today know as quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics is embedded in all what we essentially use around us telephones, electronics, lasers, everything in fact uh, I would say between 20% and 30% and, and of, of the gross national product of the world is based on these three papers I mean, work on that, that was something OECD at a certain moment uh, calculated. And uh, I would say these three papers actually was a shift of paradigm. It was a change from the Newtonian way of thinking to a modern way of thinking. Not that Newton was wrong, he was not able to describe the smallest in our universe, the atoms, and today we know there's something smaller, quarks uh, and leptons. But actually, things change there, and they still hold. That's the point. I mean, 100 years after he wrote his papers, they are actually valid still, and we build on them. The Niels Bohr Institute is a special place. And those who work there know it, and don't forget to remind you of it. After all, 23 Nobel laureates in the natural sciences have either worked here, or been associated with this institute at some point in their careers. To this day, the institute attracts great minds like former Harvard University professor Charles Marcus, who has chosen Niels Bohr Institute as the place to research into the quantum mechanics of electronic devices, and is developing a new research center here for this purpose. The idea of coming to uh, the Niels Bohr Institute uh, really came about through a sabbatical visit a couple of years ago, and my discovering uh, what is exciting, interesting, uh, and enjoyable uh, place it is and, and how much I enjoyed Denmark and Copenhagen uh, as places to live for myself and my family. And, um, and realizing that there was a lot of science here that would bring out new aspects of the things that I'm interested in, uh, new uh, opportunities for um, establishing a large research center and, and really new collaborations. And I, I think that that was the main interest was the idea of developing uh, something uh, big and focused on problems in the quantum mechanics of electronic devices and having a whole team of people that could work on it together uh, in a place that's uh, very favorable for that kind of research. Even if the theories and research worked with at the Niels Bohr Institute can seem counterintuitive or just plain difficult to understand, much of it affects the working of objects and phenomena in our daily lives. The layman uh, 
knows about electrons, I would say, in, in two contexts. One is electricity flowing through a wire, in which electricity flows like a, a, a fluid, and also as the electrons that form the orbitals in an atom. Both of those are electrons, but they behave in a very different way. Now that we can miniaturize electronics to the point where the flow of electricity through a wire and the orbiting electrons around an atom aren't that different in size, the quantum mechanical nature of how electrons move, carry electricity, and live in the little boxes that we can build for them uh, becomes a problem in quantum mechanics. And it's a new way of viewing the flow of electricity, and it's uh, what we're interested in. Some people have all the fun. Whether it is tracing the earliest human arrivals in Australia, or tracking the path of mammoths across Ice Age Europe, or discovering and analyzing 20-ton meteorites like this one, which was found in northern Greenland, the scholars and students at the Center for Geogenetics have a job that is anything but boring. Geogenetics is a, a center of excellence and uh, it houses uh, everything from geneticists to geologists. So it's kind of an interdisciplinary center where we work at everything from understanding you know, previous human migrations to understanding previous climatic changes and what is the effects in the future, for example, of climate change. Uh, but also we are working with uh, the detecting, uh, you can say, the genetic background for various types of diseases as well. So it's kind of a very, uh, it's, it's very diverse uh, center in terms of research uh, topics. Besides investigating the genetic background of common diseases like cancer, and in that way trying to develop new patient-specific cures, geogenetics can provide answers about where a population originally came from. One example is this ancient Greenlander. This is the oldest evidence of human presence in Greenland. It is 4,000 years old, and by sequencing the genome of this individual from a tuft of hair, the scientists here discovered that this person is genetically not the ancestor of present-day Greenlanders. It revealed there had been a previous unrecognized migration from the old world, that is, from Asia into Greenland, and that this population at some point went extinct without leaving any descendants in the new world. This discovery revealed that the Greenlandic population, the Inuits, is a much younger phenomenon than people previously thought. Sometimes, discoveries like this can cause controversy. Definitely, yes, uh, because, uh, I mean, it, it do changes, uh, either it confirms people's assumption. I mean, another example is the Aborigine Australian we have on the other side, where we could show it's a very, very ancient population, for example, that fits very well with their own belief about being a very ancient population. So they were, of course, very happy with the Greenlanders. Some people were not so happy about it. But I think, uh, nevertheless, I mean, it's good to know the truth, right? And then we just have to adapt, you know, because it's also important in terms of, for example, medical care. I mean, if a population has been isolated for a very long time, like the Aborigine Australians, for example, you can say then uh, the suitability to drugs might very well be very different from other populations uh, even close by. Every year, new students begin their studies at Copenhagen University's different faculties. It starts with the matriculation ceremony, where they are welcomed by the university rector, and for the first time step into rooms steeped with history and tradition, and get a sense of the achievements made here. Later, they attend a big party to get to know each other better, before the hard work starts. Even if there is time to enjoy sitting on the grass in the fine summer sunshine, life at Copenhagen University for students is also about a lot of hard work. There are commitments to be met, lectures to be attended, papers to be written, and one thing that both uh, teachers as well as educationalists as well as the government education ministry have talked about is to bring researchers and research closer to the students themselves. And that means asking experts and researchers to commit more of their time in lecture halls, not just in the research laboratories, and by doing that, to bring students
closer to the cutting edge of their fields, whatever that may be. We have had a tradition uh, to have a little bit of a separation between the research and, uh, and education, and we think that there's a lot of potential in actually merging those two areas much more. And that requires new pedagogical techniques, new ways of teaching, maybe more problem-oriented uh, teaching uh, strategies. And so we are moving away from uh, big, uh, you know, lectures in uh, big classes uh, where a single person is uh, talking to a lot of uh, students uh, and possibly into new ways of, uh, of transferring knowledge. We need to constantly aim to even higher our uh, standard. And therefore I've said that all our Danish universities within the next three years have to increase the quality while educating even more. So we are putting a pressure on our uh, institutions to develop the quality of their education and for example making sure that uh, some of the best researchers are in fact also teaching so that we don't have the best researchers in the labs and then uh, other people teaching the students. We need to make sure that some of our best and brightest researchers are also making the quality go into the students through uh, their teaching. While the natural sciences tend to dominate Copenhagen University's international profile, its faculties of law, theology, social sciences and the humanities are all well recognized in Denmark and across Europe. Among these, the university's department of political science is especially prominent, and that's because it has such a strong impact on Danish society and public debate. The main philosophy is that it has to be uh, related to practice, so it is not only a theoretical field that we are teaching within, but we um, educate our students in having also a practical related uh, sense of politics and uh, preparing them in this way to work within the public administration, to work as politicians or whatever interest organization they may come to work to. So it is indeed um, study that prepares our students very well to engage in the future job tasks that they will, that they will undertake. Actually, many of the coming political leaders and civil servants in Denmark begin their career with studies at the Social Science Faculty, located at a former hospital building in downtown Copenhagen. Besides educating the young people for a future in the central administration, the professors at the Social Science Faculty, like all others at Copenhagen University, have an obligation to share their knowledge with the rest of society. We have an obligation to disseminate our knowledge, of course, but we also have a freedom to choose the way in which we disseminate this, um, this knowledge. So this means that we can uh, act as experts in the media, of course, but it will also be when we go out and present our research to interest organizations, to public libraries, uh, to wherever societal part that we engage in. So dissemination really have a, a broad spectrum here. Um, and, and of course, we are obliged to spread our knowledge and we are also eager to do so, but we are free to pick the form that we want to do it in as long as it is uh, based within our research and has a good code of conduct, should we say so. That is all for today's program. Thanks for being with us. We will continue our tour in the University of Copenhagen. Before we go, we'll present you a clip of CNC documentary about the natural secrets of Yellowstone National Park. Please enjoy. Bye for now. Yellowstone breathes. We don't know exactly what it means. We keep an eye on it. And the larger the potential eruption, the more indication it's going to give. You know, the whole federal government would be alerted. 